اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین و صلی اللہ علیہ سیدنا محمد و آلہ طاہر السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ ایوریون There is a, a very deep advice in Nahj al-Balagha in which Amir al-Mun alayhi salam passes on his experience of life to his son. This is the 31st letter of Nahj al-Balagha where it is said that Sayyid Razi says that uh, when he was in Hadirin on his way back to Safin, Amir al-Mu'mineen, when they were camping at night, he wrote this letter to his son. Now, in that letter, of course, the letter is very long, very deep, very deep, different aspects of life, different aspects of human nature on this earth. The first thing that Imam Ali Salam says that this is from Min al Walid al Fan al Muqarr al Zaman. I have acknowledged the power of time on me, the toll of time on me that now whatever Allah has given me they are just becoming weaker and weaker he starts like this one very important thing that he mentions during this letter is my son you should know the one who created life created death don't be puzzled by this as we have in Surah Al-Mulk he created life and death so that try you, test you, put you through a process of testing uh, to become a parent, which one of you is better in, in, in action. So the one who created life created death. The one who has given health has given impairment as well. This is very puzzling, very puzzling. Why Allah does this? Then Imam Ali Salam continues and says that if you don't understand anything of these issues in life, why, for example, some people are created like this, some people in other way, then you should attribute it to your own ignorance, not to Allah's ignorance. We have yet to learn many things from the wisdom behind the creation of this life. Why people are created differently? Why some people are given more than others? Now this more can be talent, can be health, can be power, can be wealth, and all these things. Why is this like that? Why Allah has? Usually we tend to think that, well, these are irregularities in life. Now, Imam Ali Salam says that these are not irregularities. This is life. This is how Allah has created us. Some of us have certain things that others don't have. Some of us have health, some don't have. There are hidden aspects, hidden aspects in every human being, which may not be quite recognizable by us at the beginning. For example, if we see that someone is impaired in their listening, hearing, or in their vision, we think that that's a great uh, toll on us. However, we may not regard certain other aspects that are absent in other human beings. Certain other talents which are present in those who are impaired in that way, we do not, real, we do not think about, we do not calculate these things. And we cannot, of course, this is something, a grand plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't know. The only thing is, Allah tells us, appreciate whatever you have. This is the important thing. Appreciate whatever I have given you. And certainly Allah will compensate for everything. There's one verse in the Quran, this is about, if you don't like something, if for example, you marry you don't like your, life, your wife your, or your husband, or in other matters, you are given a child, you think that this is not the child that you wanted, you want some, something better, for example, more talented, more powerful, more healthy. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, فَعَسَى أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَيَجْعَلُ اللَّهُ فِيهِ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا You may dislike something, but Allah may have placed huge grace and bounty in that. We don't know. 
Sometimes we are given, uh, for example, a blessing, blessing of a child who is in one way impaired or in one way or another. And we don't know, for example, first of all, that child individually may have talents that apparently healthy children don't have. And secondly, by us showing affection, by us showing love, by us taking care of them, what Allah is given to, going to give us. Certainly, whoever Allah has created, he loves them. Whether he gives us full health or half health or whatever, whatever Allah has given us, he has given us out of love. And whatever he has actually deprived us with, he has done it out of wisdom. It's not just a sort of precarious thing that Allah didn't know, Allah made a mistake, for example. In this case, there was an accident or something like that. No. There are wisdom behind these things that yet unknown to us. As Amir al-Mumin says to his son, that if you cannot figure out what is happening in this world, why the one who gives life takes life, why the one who gives health gives impairment, if you cannot figure it out, then do not attribute ignorance to God. Attribute it to your ignorance and wait until you may realize. And if we do not realize here, we may realize in the stages of other stages of our life, which is coming uh, for us, inshallah, after this life. Now, this asa and takrahu shay'an, sometimes you may dislike something. Is a word of wisdom. In every aspect of our life, it's like that. Things happen to us we don't like. We think that it shouldn't have happened to us. But Allah says, wait, you will realize that there is great khair in this. Now, we have prophets who were somehow impaired. We have huge personalities in history who were somehow impaired. But Allah gave them the knowledge and awareness about their powers. And this is what we have to do. You know, at, fortunately, of course, in, with the modern science, it has become much easier to make people who are impaired in one way or another aware of their other aspects of the other aspects of their talent, talents. And this is very important. Let me give you one give you one example. And these examples tell us that you should never isolate an impaired person. Or you should never allow them to isolate themselves. You should have to help them to socialize, to come. There is one example, someone came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and said that I'm blind and I cannot walk to the mosque. Would you acquit me, give me leave so that I pray at home? Prophet said, no. Even if you have to tie a rope between the mosque and your house and come with that rope, come. Is this very, a very telling example? Of course, it was not possible to do. I mean, he would have somehow blocked the roads and everything. But Prophet is saying that, okay, seek help and come. Ask someone to bring you. Even if you have to tie a rope between mosque and your house, do it and come. It means it is, of course, very uh, unfair if these people should be isolated. And then, if they are isolated, the other aspects of their talents, what Allah has given them, which are hidden to us, would not develop. The whole idea of this life is that we develop what Allah has given us. Of course, Allah has not given us things equally. Your IQ is certainly more than my IQ. I cannot complain to Allah so wonder why you give me less IQ than others. But I have to develop what Allah has given me. And do not compare myself with others. That's the important thing. Now, one very beautiful example of how the Prophet insisting, insisted on developing certain aspects is Bilal. You know, Bilal stuttered when he spoke. He could not speak well. And he could not pronounce certain words. He was a slave. He was deprived of many social states, all social states, everything. 
And when he wanted to say, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, you know this. He said, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. Now, Prophet made him the Mu'adhan. Listen, this is very important. This is very interesting. This gives us lessons. Made him the Mu'adhan. Now, would you put someone as Mu'adhan who cannot pronounce words correctly? And people came to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, could someone else say the Adhan and instead of all the time when he says, Ashhadu Allah, la, la, people may laugh in their, in the, in their mouths. Apparently, I mean, this, this may have happened. That's, Bilal, for example, going to say Adhan, say, Ashhadu Allah, ilaha illallah. Ashhadu Anna Muhammadan Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Prophet insisted, no, no one except Bilal should say the Adhan. Now, no one except Bilal should say the Adhan. Means that I, I'm aware he's pronouncing it like that. But he had things, talents, which you don't have. He has a spirituality, has a spirituality which you don't have. He has certain aspects in him that are more important than pronunciation of Sheen. It is more important and Prophet actually developed it. I talked about other prophets. Musa alayhi salam. Musa started as well when he wanted to speak. And this is what, why Pharaoh actually condemned him. Am ana khayrun min hadha alladhi huwa maheen. Wala yakadu yubin. Look how arrogant Pharaoh was. Mocking, ridiculing, despising a person who probably could not speak nicely. Now, Am ana khayrun min hadha alladhi huwa maheen. Wala yakadu yubin. I am better or this man who has no honor at all, like for example, honor of being from a royal family or something, he cannot, he cannot speak correctly. This was a problem. Musa knew the first time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed him, the first thing Musa said, my tongue would not flow. I cannot speak fluently. So, Farsal ila Harun, let Harun do this. Apparently, I will help, but let Harun go. Harun was very, very eloquent in speaking because he was a speaker in Banu Israel. Musa had heard him while he was young. He was preaching Banu Israel. Harun is more eloquent than me. He can speak better than me. Now, apparently, this is. I know, I know Harun speaks better than you. I know that your tongue would not flow nicely, but Harun doesn't have what you have, isn't it? Harun cannot do this mission because there are talents in you which cannot be found in Harun. And therefore I appoint you and then he said, okay, so help me. Take this, this tie, this knot from my tongue so that I can speak fluently. Now, whether it was taken or not, or was it fully taken or not, I don't know, because later on, Pharaoh says he cannot speak nicely. So, you see, if we really realize that, and these are lessons for us, that there have been huge people in history. There have been grand people in history who were impaired somehow or others, and they were given this, these talents which they could develop it. Another example I give you about a blind man who many of injunctions of your faith, many codes of your faith you have taken from him, Abu Basir. Abu Basir al-Asadi, who was a companion of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, many of traditions in Kafi about fiqh and other things we, we have learned from Abu Basir. Our theology we have learned from Abu Basir. And he was a man of talent, knowledge. He was a politician. When this uh, uh, issue of uh, Fatahiyya 
and uh, and Zaidia were developing. She was the one who stood firm against it and actually made an impact in Shia history. And he was blind right from the beginning. But he had someone who was helping him moving around. And this someone is very famous in history. Uh, Ali, Ali ibn Abi Hamza al Bata'ini, they call him Qa'idu Ab, Abi Basir, the one who was the guide for Abu Basir. Wherever he wanted to go, this Ab, Ali ibn Abi Hamza used to, to take him. So you see, we have these people, and our Imam actually gave them the opportunity. Not only gave them, encouraged them, helped them to develop whatever Allah had given given them. When the other people among the companions of Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq to have this high position of Abu Basir, of course they were. But they, they didn't have that talent which were given to them by uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, we think that someone is blind, but some of us, many of us who can see, are more blind than them, more blind. As we have in one hadith from the Prophet, peace be on him, لَيْسَ الْأَعْمَى مَنْ يَعْمَى بَصَرُهُ إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَى مَنْ تَعْمَى بَصِيرَتُهُ The blind is not the one who doesn't have vision, who is impaired in their vision. The blind is one who doesn't have insight. And many of us who think that people who are less able than us in their movement, in their vision, they are actually less favored by God, we don't have that insight, we don't have that basira, we don't know. And of course, as Amir al says to his son, you don't know the wisdom behind these things. You later on wait until you will see. So, to how can we encourage how can we encourage people who have certain disabilities, impairments, and for that reason they feel shy, they feel embarrassed to take part in community activities, to come to other people, to mix with other children. First of all, we have to educate, we have to educate the society. That's very important. Alhamdulillah, we are living in a society where people with impairments are respected very much. Sometimes we go to our own Muslim communities, Muslim countries, we see that it's not the behavior of a Muslim. They mock, they make jokes and such things, which is absolutely uncivilized, absolutely uh, 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 an act of uh, dishonor that people may do. We have to educate our community, we have to educate the wider society. That's, uh, as Amirul Mumin says, this is, as I said, very deep, I cannot emphasize this more. Anna al mu'afi huwa al mubtali. The one who gives health gives impairment as well. The one who gives health brings disease as well. And you have to know that there is some wisdom there, but we have to cope with it as Allah wants us to, to cope with it. So, to encourage them, they may need help. They may, they may need physical help. They may need psychological help. They may need spiritual help. And all these should be provided. And this is something, uh, I think, one of the blessings of the parents of children with some sort of uh, special need is that Allah has made them like angels to look after them. And this would have great reward, of course. Things sometimes may be very difficult in this world. I may say this, you may say, Sheikh, you don't have a, a, a child with special need yourself, you are talking about it. I know, I know there are always difficulties and such things. But if we have patience over difficulties, then the reward is so great. The reward is very huge in the Day of Judgment. And we should know, Allah is just. No one is deprived of something in this world unless Allah would compensate for him in the next world. That is certainly what justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would actually imply. 
There's one verse in the Quran about Prophet Isa alayhi salam. You know when, of course, the Jews uh, accused his mother of indecency, Allah made him to speak in cradle. And that was the only time he spoke. Then he, he grew up and naturally he started to speak. That was a miraculous type of a speech just to uh, somehow uh, acquit uh, his mother of the accusation which the Jews were uh, directing at her. So he said that قَالَ إِنِّي عَبْدُ اللَّهِ أَعْطَانِي الْكِتَابِ وَجَعَلَنِي نَبِيَّ I am worshipper of God. Allah has given me a book and has made me a prophet. وَجَعَلَنِي مُبَارَكًا أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتْ He has made me to be blessed wherever I am. Now, when Imam Jafar was explaining this verse and apparently he was asked, what is the meaning of Mubarak? I am blessed. You know, baraka, baraka is, is good, is khair. Whatever is khair is baraka. Uh, he, he, he was asked, what is the meaning of baraka, mubarakan? He said, mubarakan yani nafa'an. Mubarak means someone whose benefit goes to everyone, who benefits others. This is the meaning of mubarak. And we know Isa alayhi salam was Mubarak, Nafa spiritually, and he was Nafa physically. He, he gave benefit to people who needed the spiritual help, and he gave benefit to people who needed physical help by healing them, by curing them. This is what, of course, Allah had given them. Now, nowadays, of course, we can say medics, Physicians have that potential knowledge to cure people, if not in that miraculous way, of course by the science, by the science that Allah has given us, they, 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 they are able to do that. But the other aspect of his nafa is we help those who are in need of help. And one of the things that uh, one of the sisters told me that we need help here for people, for volunteers to come forth and help us with children with special needs. And how Mubarak it would be, how full of Barakah it would be if, for example, some of us can spend one hour a week, two hours a week, or whatever we can, to come and see what are the needs, how can we help, how can we uh, offer uh, some sort of help to the, this uh, community which has actually embarked on a very Mubarak uh, uh, endeavor to help the children with special needs. And uh, if we can help those who are weaker than us, if we can help those who have some sort of need more than us, then of course this is a charity this is a barakah, this is grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and many other things that uh, we, we have in, in our faith. Let me mention one hadith from Prophet peace be on, upon him. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من قاد أعمى أربعين خطوة غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه Whoever takes the hand of a blind man and takes him for 40 steps, guiding him. Whatever sin they have done in the past will be forgiven. Can we believe that? That how Allah is, and this shows how Allah is sensitive on these issues. That you help people who are in need. Helping someone who's in need is the highest type of charity that you can do. Sometimes we may not have money, we may not have wealth to give charity, big charity, good charity, we may not have it. But we have, we have power, we have health, we have knowledge. With those we can help others and this is min afdal uh, sadaqa. Sometimes there are things that we really don't regard to be worshipped, don't regard to have any reward. But the Prophet corrected, 
the mindset of his companions. Look at this hadith. Dakhala abdun al janna bi ghusnin min shawkin kana ala tariq al muslimin fa amatahu an. A person entered into paradise. Apparently, he's talking about a real person, someone who died, who passed away, or just, just a new Muslim who passed away. He said, someone entered paradise because he removed a bunch of thorn which was on the way, in, on the pathway of Muslimin. Just removed it. And for that reason, he entered paradise. You may say, what about converting to Islam? What about Salat? Well, these are kafarats. In, 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 in that very beautiful tradition from the Prophet, which is reported by our Ayyam Salam, said, Salatun munjiatun, wa salatun mubiqatun, wa salatun kafaratun, wa salatun darajat. Certain acts we do which save us, like fear of Allah, taqwa. Certain acts we do which uh, destroy us, like greed and attitudes of the heart. There are three things which are kafara. One of them, the Prophet says, your five-time prayer during the day. This is kafara for you, for whatever you do, other sins. But if you want daraja, if you want to raise in your rank, then the thalathun darajatun it'amu ta'am wa ifsha'u salam wa salatu bil layl wa nasun yam feed people spread peace and salam and pray during the night while other people are sleeping so why I mention this I just wanted to say that you may say this man was doing salat and everything okay these were kafarat for his sins but what he did here by removing by removing this bunch of thorn, the Prophet says he deserved to enter paradise. So, do not underestimate if you have someone with a special need, or if you can help others with a special need, do not underestimate the reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give on that. And do not underestimate the talent of these children with special need. If we can help them to develop what they have. Sometimes we cannot help them. We ignore. We actually think that they are useless. We think that they are useless, which is absolutely wrong. If we can develop, it's just like reviving a person. And as we have in, in Surah Ma'idah, Whoever gives life to one person is as if he has given life to the humanity. Whoever takes life from one person and taking life and giving life is not just by killing and curing, no. It's allowing people to develop in their lives. And there's one very interesting thing in this uh, ayah and that is Every individual, every individual worth like the whole humanity in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter how they are created, whether they are men or women, whether they have power, talent, or they don't have, whether they are wealthy or poor, whether they, are, they need special needs or they don't need, every individual equals to the whole humanity in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is something that we have to really ponder upon. Uh, let me mention one last uh, hadith from Al-Kafi, and then I finish my talk. And if we have time for Q&A, inshallah, we'll follow. Inna lillahi ibadan fil ard yas'awna fi hawa'aj nas Allah has servants on the earth who try to remove the needs of people. Needs of people. These are the ones who are secure on the day of judgment. We boast about our prayer, our fasting, and all these things. Sometimes we ignore these aspects of our life. And now these traditions, these ahadiths, actually remind us of 
other aspects of worship, other aspects of spirituality, of godliness, and inshallah, Allah will help us to follow. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi tahirin. Thank you very much, uh, Sheikh Mahmanpur. That was uh, uh, enlightening, ennobling, uh, and inshallah, I hope we can all benefit. Uh, but for us to, to benefit even further, um, perhaps it might be useful for me to summarize uh, what you've said in a, in a, in a few points. Um, and please feel free to correct me as I go along. Um, we've started off today's talk with uh, a, a letter from Nahjul Balagha. Uh, in which uh, it is mentioned about uh, the fact that every individual has been given uh, various talents and abilities and that these must be used to their greatest uh, effect. Uh, we must realize and recognize that within the kingdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there are no inconsistencies, there are no irregularities uh, and that there are no coincidences. Everything has been done by design and by his infinite wisdom we have been granted with the variety of, of talents that we have in our communities. Um, people who are gifted individuals are a huge grace and bounty on us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's something that we must understand. Uh, and that there, there are many examples uh, from history uh, in which various personalities who have uh, various special needs uh, have been included within their respective communities uh, and examples were given of uh, Hazrat Bilal uh, being made the Mu'addin uh, of Prophet Musa as well and of Abu Basir. Uh, finally, we were also asked to uh, encourage uh, these individuals to get involved with the community and the very first thing we must do is to educate society around us uh, and, and understand that within families who have individuals who have special needs, that patience is such a fundamental element. Uh, finally, last but not least, um, volunteers, of course, is, is something that was emphasized on. Uh, the benefits and the rewards for uh, these volunteers are, are humongous. And uh, of course, volunteers are, are always required in any sort of capacity. Um, so what we'll do at this stage is, is we've got a bit of time for uh, some question and answer. Um, we've got a fantastic opportunity here um, to, to really uh, to, to question and, and ask uh, the Sheikh various questions that we may have. Um, I would actually like to give this opportunity in two ways. Uh, so the first is, is I'm happy to open it up to the floor uh, to, to sort of uh, go between uh, the ladies section and the gents section uh, asking people uh, to ask their questions. I will repeat your question on the mic as we are streaming this live on YouTube. Uh, so for the benefit of our online viewers, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, the second way to do it, in fact, is to connect to our free Wi-Fi system, the KSIMC free Wi-Fi. And I'm happy for you to WhatsApp your questions uh, to me. Uh, that is the number on screen there. Please go ahead and WhatsApp any questions that you may have. Uh, and I will go ahead and ask uh, Sheikh straight away. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's begin with uh, any questions and I will start from the ladies side. Do we have any questions on the ladies side? Yeah. <laughs> Please go ahead. Uh, Alaykum salam. Two questions. One is, um, how can we made a lot of strides but we're always waiting for somebody else to to pick up the I don't know what the word the what? The straw. So um, how can we encourage brothers um, to help? Especially when we have um, we're going to be having an influx of younger males joining our Manchester and stuff. What advice would you give them specifically to to not be afraid and to take up that challenge? Sure. 
Uh, can I just summarize just for the, for the, for the mic? So the question was, uh, how do we encourage more of our brothers uh, to get involved with volunteering within our community, specifically for the uh, support of those with, with special needs? Uh, I think it's quite telling that in a lot of our institutions, uh, whether that is uh, the madrasa or the youth network, uh, that generally tends to be a, a, uh, a skew uh, in favor of more female volunteers uh, and a little bit less in terms of male volunteers. So how do we encourage more brothers, more men to get involved in the voluntary sector? Well, this is the trick of nature, isn't it? Has put more compassion and love in women than in men, probably. And that's why there are more volunteers among the female than the male. But I don't know, I see brothers are volunteering in many different aspects. I don't know about this particular uh, activity, but I see there are many brothers who are actually helping in, in, in many other aspects. However, having said that, we know that uh, certainly the compassion and love which is in the heart of a woman is not in the heart of a man. And uh, not that men are less than women in, in, in any respect, but this is how the mother in love has been put in, in women. And they actually can somehow extend that mother in love to others as well uh, beyond their their children. And one very effective way is that their wives tell them off and they have to do it. I mean, there is no other way. <laughs> Um, so from a, uh, from a perspective that when the child becomes balig uh, and when the, the issue of, of male-female interaction takes place, um, how, do we, how do we educate uh, and how can we uh, sort of get around this uh, in a way that is uh, Islamically friendly? Does that summarize your question? Yeah? Well, certainly in certain situations we need male volunteers in certain situations we need female volunteers and i think we have to educate our community that this is an important issue in the same way that it's important to go to Matam and Khoshali, it's important to attend these uh, needs in the community uh, I, I was reading a hadith which uh, says that whoever could help with the need of one person that's act would equal to one month fasting in Etikaf. You, you, so you see how important it is. We have to bring this awareness into our community. If you say that males are not very forthcoming, we have to bring this uh, awareness into our male community especially to, uh, to actually realize the importance and the reward for such help which uh, is uh, great in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and inshallah gradually we can we can reach the target thank you very much thank you um, we've got another question here um, so it reads that I I have a daughter with special needs uh, and I also work with children in our community who also have special needs as well um, I see it very common that we go to the local authority or uh, the secular community for assistance before our own community. So how can we get our community to become the first point of contact when it comes to supporting us as parents? Uh, what is it that our community lacks in this regard? Well, one thing that comes to our mind is that certainly the wider society has more resources. Maybe our community lacks those resources. And it's very difficult for a community to bring all the resources needed f to look after the, for example, a limited number of people with, uh, with special needs. Because the wider society 
is dealing with great numbers and is actually funneling resources into it, they may have, of course, uh, uh, better resources to, to deal. I think we have to, uh, we, we, we don't have to actually ignore what the wider society is offering. And then we have to create something inside our society with more special needs. There are certain needs which, of course, the wider society can address. There are other needs which the wider society, the secular society, cannot address. I think our community should focus on those things and use from both resources, the resources of the, uh, the, the mainstream society, the mainstream resources, and the special resources in the community. It needs budget. Of course, it needs help, it needs uh, uh, more people become aware and uh, somehow dedicate funds to it. Uh, and I'm sure that if people are educated and give funds, uh, the community is uh, more than willing to offer to, to, to provide this, uh, this help, inshallah. If I can actually ask a follow-up question to that. Um, you mentioned the um the idea of, of using uh, sort of the local authorities' uh, strengths, uh, you know, to our advantage. And obviously, there are certain things that only our community would be able to give us. Um, obviously, one of those things would, would obviously be, you know, religious guidance. So as, as far as things like teaching the Quran, for instance, um, how, how as a community do we go about um, educating uh, our children with special needs in um, religious aspects, um, you know, how do we go about, um, you know, sort of starting this? Um, the, the particular question is that we have no idea uh, what and how much uh, knowledge do we have to give in this regard. Where do we start? Well, certainly, those with special needs need special means for being educated. Of course, for example, those who are visually impaired, they need probably Braille, a sort of literature. Those who, are, uh, who have impairment in hearing, they need different types of uh, means for, uh, for education. We have to have, the, uh, if we want to teach them religious teachings, we have to have all these means at our disposal. I know that in Mashhad there was uh, one person, he was a father of one of my friends who's passed away. He was a cleric. And he went and learned this uh, sign language for, for uh, people with hearing impairment. And he actually in, uh, established a religious school, especially for people who had difficulty in their hearing. And he, many students he had, he taught the uh, the, the rules of salat, fast, recitation, everything, single-handedly he could do it. Now, if one person can do it and can dedicate his, dedicate his life for that, certainly a community can do it. Uh, it needs some dedicated people and also, of course, the means which are uh, very important, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the devices which are very important for uh, people to be educated. In the those devices or uh, means which are in the wider con used in the wider context, we have to uh, provide them for this very specific uh, provision of religious education. The way we are teaching other children, I mean, we, you talked about the the amount, the level of knowledge. Well, we are teaching our other children with the level of knowledge that we are we are having in madrasa. So the same thing would go to people with special needs. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let me open up the floor to the gents side, in fact. Do we have any questions from the brother side, from gents? Any questions here? Okay. Uh, if we don't, let me, uh, let me ask yeah, we a... Do we? Sorry, yes.
friends, imams, all companions, all luminaries, who may have somehow uh, displayed some special kind of treatment or adjustment to, to mental exam, mental challenges. Sure. Um, sorry, so for our online viewers, just to, to summarize your question, um, divided into two parts. So the, firstly, from a, a, a Sharia perspective, we've been giving the examples of those with uh, physical uh, special needs, but what about those with, with mental uh, disabilities? Uh, from a Sharia compliant perspective, uh, what is our, our, um, our um, sort of responsibilities uh, for them? Uh, in supporting them. And secondly, can we cite any examples in history uh, of uh, those within our, our, um, our, our history books uh, who may have had uh, such mental disabilities and how were those addressed? Yeah, I'm sure if uh, we investigate, we can find many examples. I didn't look into that, but uh, I came across one saying about uh, helping mentally retarded people and the care which should be provided for them is more than the care provided for others. Uh, as I said, certainly, I mean, as this is not something which is specific to a limited time or uh, era, this has been something continuously going in the history and I'm sure we can find many uh, examples from luminaries, even from uh, spiritual figures, that they had actually uh, this problem with some of their children. And uh, the, the most important thing is that how they deal with it and how we deal the, with, this, uh, with this issue. It is, of course, uh, as you said, it is more difficult than uh, physically impaired people. But uh, the, uh, one of the good things about human uh, race is that gradually, gradually we can unravel the mysteries of human life and the, 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 the improvement of science and knowledge would help us. Uh, for the time being, what I can say is that it needs more patience, it is more care, more attention, and we should not be tired of doing it. And we have to actually try to find ways and means to educate them, to develop certain aspects in them which are probably hidden. But certainly we are always, we are always hostage of our ignorance, lack of knowledge. If we have knowledge, more knowledge, more awareness, then we can help more. Thank you very much indeed. I, uh, I, I have a question here. Um, so the question goes, how can we encourage teachers to take up opportunities to learn how to teach those with special needs, um, especially if training is involved? Um, the, the, the issue that's faced is that a lot of teachers don't attend uh, in great numbers to volunteer or to turn up to training sessions? How do we get them uh, to take up these opportunities? Well, certainly, as far as I can think, is that this is not something that everyone is interested in. And if we want to somehow make sessions generally for all teachers to learn, it wouldn't work. There are always a margin, uh, a, a, a limited number of people in every community or in every category of people who may have interest in, in these things. And we have to work on them and make them, these people who have interest, to uh, in, invest in their education rather than investing in educating everyone uh, equally. It wouldn't work. In educating everyone equally wouldn't work. Everyone is not interested. So we have to find out who is more interested, who has more uh, inclination, and we invest our resources on them. And I'm sure that would, inshallah, um, uh, have a very good uh, feedback. Do we have any, uh, any question from the sisters? Any questions from the ladies' side? Okay. Um, if I can, in fact, then uh, uh, pose a question of my own. Um, and that is the, the question of what if. Um, 
as someone who has a brother who has autism uh, and having known other friends of mine, family members uh, who also have people who have got special needs, uh, there are many times when the family members will ask, um, what if my life were different? What if this individual was quote unquote normal, which is a, a terrible word to use? Um, how do we avoid such, uh, such a mindset from creeping in? Well, this needs huge contemplation on part of people about the philosophy of life. Uh, I think what Imam Ali alayhi salam said in, in that letter is very, very deep, that you have to know that this is part of life and no what if would work here. It's just like if say, what if, if for example, I was a woman? What if, if for example, I, I was a, a person living in, in, in Mars? It's just like that. Ifs never happen. We have to somehow bring it to our minds, accommodate ourselves with this idea that المبتلي, the one who has created people sound has created some in this way. We cannot say they are unsound, but have made people differently. And we have to accept that as, of course, uh, something which uh, is part of the overall human progress towards the perfection which Allah has seen for us. Uh, I know this is always the case, not only in this case. I mean, things happen in our life which always we say, what if it did not happen? What if I was not there? For example, we go and we have an accident. Oh, what if I had not accepted, for example, this invitation and I wouldn't have had this accident? These what ifs never uh, has any reality, any truth in it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, do we have any any further questions uh, from the gent side? Otherwise, there is one more question which I have uh, I have over here. But before I go to that, if I can open up to the floor to the gents, yes. Yeah, let me just uh, summarize the question and thank you very much for it, Amar. Uh, the question is this, um, for those individuals who have got special needs or who are gifted individuals, um, is there access uh, for these individuals to go to study abroad in the Islamic seminaries, uh, for example in Qum or in Najaf, is such access available for these individuals? Yes, the access is available and they are actually accommodating that. And I know some people who uh, had this sort of uh, special needs who have been studying there. And I'm sure even if the facilities aren't enough, we have to bring to their attention that this is something that you have to do as Muslims. Other communities are doing it. What about Muslims? If we as Muslims, with all these teachings, we don't do it, of course we have to bring it to their attention. But I'm, uh, I'm certain that they have these facilities. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed.